Let's go ahead. I uh, believe we left off in 1 Kings chapter 9. And there's a little... Again, chapter 9, it's kind of a... a it's kind of a hodgepodge, a melting pot, a mixed stew of various things about Solomon's reign. And not every ancient version of the Bible even tells all of this in the same order, uh, which just goes to show how mixed it is. I believe we left off in verse 15. In verse 15 it says, Now this is the account of the forced labor which King Solomon levied to build the house of the Lord, his own house, the Milo, the wall of Jerusalem, Hazor, Megiddo, and Gezer. For Pharaoh, king of Egypt, had gone up and captured Gezer and burned it with fire and killed the Canaanites who lived in the city and had given it as a dowry to his daughter, Solomon's wife. So Solomon rebuilt Gezer and lower Beth Horon, and Baalath and Tamar in the wilderness in the land of Judah. And all the storage cities which Solomon had, even the cities for his chariots and the cities for his horsemen, and all that it pleased Solomon to build in Jerusalem, in Lebanon, and in all the land under his rule. As for all the people who were left of the Amorites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites, who were not of the sons of Israel, their descendants who were left after them in the land whom the sons of Israel were unable to destroy utterly, from them Solomon levied forced laborers, even to this day. But Solomon did not make slaves of the sons of Israel, for they were men of war, his servants, his princes, his captains, his chariot commanders, and his horsemen. Alright. So what we have here is kind of a description of some of Solomon's building projects. Uh, there's 11 different things I saw mentioned here. Of course, we've read about the temple. We've read about his own house. Uh, then there's something called the Milo. We're not exactly sure what the Milo is, but we know that it was the project that Jeroboam was involved in. And Chapter 11, uh, Jeroboam was one of the overseers on that project before he uh, began his revolt against Solomon. Uh, also in here are the walls of Jerusalem. He apparently made some modifications. And then some cities that were outside Jerusalem, Hazor, Megiddo, Gezer, Lower Beth Horon, Baalath, and Tamar, and various other storage cities. Uh, now the mention of Gezer prompts a kind of a parenthetical comment. Pharaoh, king of Egypt, had gone up and captured Gezer and burned it with fire. Uh, why bring that up? Anybody remember what the story is on that? Where Gezer is in the Bible? Bes besides this place? Uh, I have to think back a little bit. Yeah. Joshua 16. What happens in Joshua 16? They did not drive out the Canaanites. Uh, in Joshua 16, which describes the territory of the tribe of Ephraim, um, you know, Joshua, there's a huge section of Joshua that describes all the cities that the various tribes were supposed to get. And at the end of it, there's usually kind of a comment about how the tribe didn't finish conquering the territory that they were supposed to conquer. And in verse 10, it says that they did, the Ephraimites, they did not drive out the Canaanites who lived in Gezer. So the Canaanites live in the midst of Ephraim to this day, and they became forced laborers. Well, in 1 Kings chapter 9, uh, to this day is no longer applicable because Pharaoh destroys the city of Gezer. Uh, the Canaanite people are wiped out as a result. And so, but it isn't Solomon that does it. And it isn't Israel that does it either. It's Pharaoh that does it for him. Pharaoh destroys Gezer as a wedding present for King Solomon, essentially. Um, and essentially, he does what Israel did not do, or could not do, in defeating the Canaanites. And Solomon, what he does in response is he rebuilds Gezer. Again, we're not given a commentary on whether this is a good thing or a bad thing. Uh, we know from reading earlier passages in Joshua that the Lord did not permit the reconstruction of Jericho, but that doesn't appear to have been the case in every city that they conquered. Um, now, so, I, I mean, are we witnessing a turnaround on the conquest of the Canaanites during Solomon's reign? Is that what's going on? 
What would you say his overall relationship with the Canaanite peoples is like? How do we evaluate it? He made slaves out of them. Yes, in verses 20 and 21. You know, that list of names, the Amorites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites, those were the peoples who Israel was supposed to be conquering in the book of Joshua. But they still haven't been conquered. So, they're put to forced labor and they persist in Israel. Now, what, what do we think of that? What was supposed to happen? <laughs> it was supposed to destroy them, alright? Now, do, has there ever been another place in the Bible where it says that Israel opted to enslave the Canaanites instead of destroying them? Okay, well the Gibeonites would be an example of that in Joshua chapter 9. Good. Um, were the Gibeonites the only example of that? Hmm? Oh, Midian was not a Canaanite group, actually. They were an external group. Technically, they were descendants of Abraham, actually. But, no. Um, in the book of Judges, if you remember, the first two chapters of the book of Judges... Uh, those chapters are marked with kind of this repeated formula about how the Israelites didn't completely drive out the Canaanites. Uh, so, for instance, the sons of Benjamin did not drive out the Jebusites. Instead, the Jebusites live among the sons of Benjamin to this day. Judges 1.21. Uh, the people of Manasseh, it says that uh, in Megiddo, that when Israel became strong, they put the Canaanites to forced labor, but they did not drive them out completely. 128. 129, Ephraim did not drive out the Canaanites who were living in Gezer. Uh, Zebulun did not drive out the inhabitants of Kitron or the inhabitants of Nahalol, so the Canaanites lived among them and became subject to forced labor. Judges 130. Asher did not drive out the inhabitants of Akko or the inhabitants of Sidon or of Ahlav or of Achzib or of Helba or of Afik or of Rehob. Long list of names there. So the Asherites lived among the Canaanites, which suggests they weren't even the dominant force in their region. And the inhabitants of the land, they did not drive them out. Naphtali did not drive out the inhabitants of Beth Shemesh or the inhabitants of Beth Anoth, but lived among the Canaanites, the inhabitants of the land. And the inhabitants of Beth Shemesh and Beth Anoth became forced labor for them. And on and on we could go with this. Uh, Dan gets actually driven out of their territory altogether. So here in Solomon's reign, we have kind of an echo of that, don't we? And we have kind of a repeat of this idea that instead of destroying the Canaanites, as Deuteronomy 7 instructed, this Solomon just put them to forced labor and used them to finish his building projects. What do we think of that? How, how do we evaluate that? What does the Lord think of that? You don't think he liked it too well. Okay. There's kind of an ominous tone. Now, what happened when Israel didn't drive out the Canaanites in the book of Judges? Hmm? They sinned and as a result, the nation was plunged into idolatry. They forsook the Lord. They forgot who He was and what He had done for them. And they served the Baals instead. They were ensnared and seduced by the people around them even though they had put them to forced labor. That was the book of Judges. But here in Solomon's reign, you've got a similar thing kind of brewing in the works. Even though Solomon's built the temple, you think, okay, well that's you know, a permanent reminder that Yahweh is God. And Solomon has demonstrated all this wisdom, and he's accumulated all this wealth for himself, and all these great things are happening, and it is, I mean, if there's a such thing as a golden age, it's happening during the reign of Solomon. But already the seeds are sown for apostasy. The seeds are sown for Israel to forsake the Lord and go back to serving the Baals. And we're going to see that unfold as we get into the rest of the book of Kings. So just kind of be aware of that. That's kind of ominous and in the background of this text. Now Solomon, there's the translation of verse 22 is a little bit, uh, I don't know how to say it, 
Because the word, it says, my version says that Solomon did not make slaves of the sons of Israel because they were men of war, his servants, his princes, his captains, his chariot commanders, as horsemen. The only problem is that in Hebrew, the word for slave and the word for servant are the same word. I don't know why they're translated differently, but it looks kind of funny. Solomon did not make slaves of Israel because they were his slaves. What? <laughs> uh, now, maybe they had a higher status. Maybe they were military servants instead of construction servants. The context, you know, perhaps indicates two different meanings. But was Solomon light and easy on the people? Did the people have an easy time during the reign of Solomon? Uh, yeah, you get to chapter 12, there's clearly a little bit of unrest going on. Uh, they say, well, you know, your father, he made our yoke hard. We want you to lighten the load. Okay, but I'll play devil's advocate here for a minute. You know, I mean, the pe local populaces love to complain about stuff all the time. And maybe they're exaggerating their complaint. Well, so what do we do about that? Well, if we keep reading and... 1 Kings chapter 12, we'll notice that Rehoboam says, uh, well, basically he concedes, yeah, you're right. My father made your yoke hard. I'm going to make it even worse. You know, which, of course, isn't a very smart move politically. But nonetheless, that there seems to be some level of legitimacy to their complaint. Uh, people characterize the service of Solomon as hard, which is biased on their part, but it technically conceded by Rehoboam in chapter 12 and verses 7, 10, 11, and 14. Um, some other notes on chapter 9. In verse 23 it says, These were the chief officers who were over Solomon's work, 550 who ruled over the people during the work. As soon as Pharaoh's daughter came up from the city of David to her house, which Solomon had built for her, then he built the Milo. Three times a year, Solomon offered burnt offerings and peace offerings on the altar, which he built to the Lord, burning incense with them on the altar, which was before the Lord. So he finished the house. King Solomon also built a fleet of ships in Ezion Geber, which is near the Eloth on the shore of the Red Sea in the land of Edom. And Hiram sent his servants with the fleet, sailors who knew the sea, along with the servants of Solomon. They went to Ophir and took 420 talents of gold from there and brought it to King Solomon. All right, so these are just kind of some miscellaneous notes here. 550 officers ruled over the workers. Solomon builds the Milo, a second reference we've seen to that. Solomon keeps the annual feasts three times a year he appears to sacrifice before the Lord. That's a fulfillment of a commandment in the law, actually, in Exodus 23. And, you know, it says, so he finished the house, which may indicate that the temple was not considered finished until they offered the sacrifices. Solomon also engages in sea trade. He builds a fleet of ships. Hiram provides the sailors, since Hiram being from the seafaring town that he is, and they go to Ophir for gold, and they bring back 420 talents of gold. That's almost 14 tons. Uh, let's see, I... Okay, I apparently did not work out the math on what that would be worth in today's dollars, but it's a lot when you consider that gold is... I did have the price of gold in the ounce. Yeah, gold is over... In today's dollars, gold is over $1,000 an ounce. And... You know, how many ounces are in a pound? How many pounds are in a ton? Solomon's going to collect 14 tons of gold from Ophir. It was a place renowned for its gold. Anybody know where Ophir is? Ooh, how, yeah. well, the, the short answer, it's a trick question. The short answer is we don't know. Uh, Africa's uh, suggestion, uh, proposals range from everywhere from Arabia to Somalia to India. So we have no idea where Ophir is. Uh, but people have guessed, and so there's a lot of guesses out there. Um, but Africa is one of those guesses. All right, any questions to the end of chapter 9? I know that some of this is uh, probably drier material. Chapter 10, let's talk about the Queen of Sheba. Oh, the Milo. A fort near Shechem. Yeah, um, you know, there's a... There's a lot of discussion about what exactly the Milo is, and yeah, Beth Milo is probably uh, what is what is being associated with there. Um, now the question is, of course, is the Milo a reference to a place name or is it a type of structure? One clue to this is in chapter 11. 
Uh, in chapter 11, it says that, um, well, in talking about Jeroboam's rebellion, in chapter 11 and verse 27, it says, This was the reason why he rebelled against the king. Solomon built the Milo and closed up the breach of the city of his father David, uh, which seems to associate whatever this thing is, the Milo, with a reparation in the wall of Jerusalem itself. Uh, now, there was a place called Beth Milo near Shechem that is mentioned in Judges 9, like you pointed out. And maybe that's, I mean, maybe that's it, and 1 Kings 11 is indicating two separate things. Um, I've always read 1 Kings 11 as talking about a repair in the wall of Jerusalem, which may suggest that Solomon built just another structure in the city. Uh, another reference to the Milo, I think, is in 2 Samuel, I want to say chapter 5. Help me out here. Um, Second Samuel chapter. Oh. oh, yep, there it is. Yeah, David lived in the stronghold, called it the city of David. David built all around from the Milo and inward. So there again is a reference to whatever this thing is, the Milo being in uh, Jerusalem. Uh, my footnote here suggests it's just a kind of a citadel. But admittedly, it's one of those things we just don't know what it is. The, the filling. Yeah, I can see that. The Hebrew word mala means fill, so milo, you can hear kind of the word play on it. I, I saw, okay, I'm, I'm seeing two hands. Uh, the landfill. Yeah, that's a suggestion too. Um, you know, we talk about filling. In this case, the filling would be an idiomatic way of talking about landfill. Um, that's another suggestion. Or a landfill. Uh, or, uh, you know, I mean, so it's, it's, or a citadel, or, I mean, we don't know what it is. That's the, the thing, because it, 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 it appears several times in the text. This is one of those words we just, we haven't really dug it up. If we had dug it up, we might know what it was, but nobody's ever dug it, dug it up. So, uh, it's one of those great mysteries that you'll have to ask David about someday. You know, I imagine we'll have more pressing things to occupy our attention when that day comes. I hadn't expected this to generate all the this discussion. All right, but that that's good. That's good that we're uh, looking at this. Um, chapter ten. Let's talk about the Queen of Sheba. Chapter ten. What? All right. Chapter ten. In the first thirteen verses, deal with the Queen of Sheba. When the queen of Sheba heard about the fame of Solomon concerning the name of the Lord, she came to test him with difficult questions. So she came to Jerusalem with a very large retinue, with camels carrying spices and very much gold and precious stones. When she came to Solomon, she spoke with him about all that was on her heart. Solomon answered all her questions. Nothing was hidden from the king which he did not explain to her. When the queen of Sheba perceived all the wisdom of Solomon, the house that he had built, the food of his table, the seating of his servants, the attendance of his waiters, and their attire, his cupbearers, his stairway by which he went up into the house of the Lord, there was no more spirit in her. And she said to the king, It was a true report about which I heard in my own land about your words and your wisdom. Nevertheless, I did not believe the reports until I came and my eyes had seen it. And behold, the half was not told me. You exceed in wisdom and prosperity the report which I heard. How blessed are your men! How blessed are these your servants who stand before you continually and hear your wisdom! Blessed be the Lord your God who delighted in you to set you on the throne of Israel because the Lord loved Israel forever. Therefore he made you king to do justice and righteousness. She gave the king 120 talents of gold and a very great amount of spices and precious stones. Never again did such abundance of spices come in as that which the queen of Sheba gave King Solomon. Also the ships of Hiram which brought gold from Ophir brought in from Ophir a very great amount of almond trees, precious stones. The king made of the almond trees supports for the house of the Lord and for the king's house. Also lyres and harps for the singers, such almond trees, have not come in again, nor have they been seen to this day. King Solomon gave to the queen of Sheba all her desire which she requested, besides what he gave her according to his royal bounty. Then she turned and went to her own land together with her, her servants. Alright. Now Sheba 
Uh, Sheba is one of those places we don't know the precise location of either. Um, it's probably in what is modern day Yemen, southern Arabian Peninsula. Oh, we don't know for 100% sure. And she comes to test Solomon with tough questions. Riddles. Um, it's the same term actually used for Samson's riddles in Judges chapter 14. She brings abundant gifts, camels, spices, gold, gemstones. And what she's doing, uh, we need to realize what the Queen of Sheba does isn't, isn't, isn't particularly exceptional. It's an exhibit A of something that a lot of different people are doing during Solomon's reign. You know, she's one of many that does this. But you know, she's singled out because of, again, just you know, the great gifts and prosperity here. One of Solomon's calls for blessing in the Psalms is that the gifts of Sheba might be given to the glorified Zion. Uh, Psalm 72. And this is one of the few Psalms, actually, that claims to have been written by Solomon himself. Psalm 72, beginning in verse 8, speaking of the king, says, May he also rule from sea to sea, and from the river to the ends of the earth. Let the nomads of the desert bow before him, and his enemies lick the dust, let the kings of Tarshish and of the islands bring presents. The kings of Sheba and Seba offer gifts. And let all kings bow down before him. All nations serve him. Isaiah also spoke about Sheba in Isaiah chapter 60. Uh, Isaiah 60 and verses 5 and 6. It says, You will see and be radiant, and your heart will thrill and rejoice. Because the abundance of the sea will be turned to you, the wealth of the nations will come to you, a multitude of camels will cover you, the young camels of Median and Ipha, all those from Sheba will come. They will bring gold and frankincense and will bear good news of the praises of the Lord. Therein is that, there again is that picture. People from the faraway, distant countries bringing gifts to the city of God. This is a sign that God has glorified His people when all the nations take their gifts and bring their wealth to the holy city. This is an image, by the way, that is even appropriated in the New Testament in the book of Revelation. Revelation 21 and 22 talk about how the kings of the earth will bring their glory to the new Jerusalem. Now this is, in part, an answer to Solomon's prayer, isn't it? Uh, in 1 Kings chapter 8, remember he prayed about you know, all the different scenarios. And one of the things he mentioned was that the foreigners might pray towards the house and that the Lord might hear them. There's a kind of a call for inclusion in the people of God with the foreigners. Now... When the Queen of Sheba comes, she brings gifts to Solomon, great and glorious gifts, and she comes to meet this king to test his wisdom, see if his reputation holds up. What happens? He is, she is unable to ask him a question that he does not have an answer for. And when she sees all of this, uh, verse 5 says, well, verse Verse 5 says that there is no more spirit in her. There's no more breath in her. She's speechless, we might say in today's language. She's speechless. Of course, she goes on and says something. Well, I mean, that's what yeah, that's true in English, though, too. We say someone's speechless, but then they go on and they talk about how speechless they are. Um, because, and why is she speechless? Why is she so impressed? Because of his wisdom. <laughs> Yeah, because even though the reports that she heard turned out to be true, it turned out that the reports that she heard were downplaying it. it, were, it was not, Solomon exceeds expectations in every way. He doesn't just meet them, he exceeds them. Solomon's servants are blessed just for the ability to stand before him and hear his wisdom. Uh, some people will point out that there's a... You know, that chapter 10 is focused more on the royal court's benefits than on the people, the nation's benefits as a whole. Um, I'm back and forth on what I think about that. That may not really be a real emphasis in the text. What's going on here, though? The queen blesses Solomon. But in verse 9, she says, Blessed be the Lord your God. Blessed be Yahweh your God, who put him on the throne. Here we have a foreigner from a faraway country made to bless the name of Yahweh. Why? Well, who's the real accomplisher here? It's not Solomon. It's the Lord who gives him the wisdom in the first place. And 
Then they have an exchange of goods. The queen gives 120 talents of gold. That means she matches Hiram's first gift from chapter 9 and verse 14. That's a lot. And the queen brings a record import of spices. Uh, and the text just kind of interjects parentheses in verses 11 and 12 and says, and by the way, Hiram brought all this stuff too. Uh, Hiram brought almug trees. Which we don't know what almug trees are because that's a transliteration of the Hebrew word almugim. Um, and, and not only do we not know what they are, uh, apparently the... The Hebrews don't, didn't know what they were either because in verse 12 it says they haven't come in again nor have they been seen to this day. We have no idea what these are. Uh, so, who knows? Um, we keep reading. Solomon turned the trees into supports for the temple and the palace and into instruments. Uh, well, why bring up Hiram? Why bring up Hiram when you're talking about the Queen of Sheba? Who's, who's the bigger contributor to Solomon? Okay, yeah. Hiram is actually Solomon's biggest contributor. You know, the Queen of Sheba might be second place. We don't know. Um, but, you know, they're, they're bringing them up, right? How do they match up? All right, and they, they've ob they're obviously very resourceful, very wealthy people since they're able to give to Solomon in this way. How do they match up to Solomon himself? How do they match up to Solomon himself? In any I mean, the only thing we have a real measure of in this text is wealth. So... How do they stack up to Solomon in that, that level? What is impressive about this text is that for all of the wealth that the Queen of Sheba and Hiram bring to Solomon, Solomon completely eclipses them. The Queen of Sheba brings 120 talents of gold in a one-time gift. Hiram brings 120 talents of gold in a one-time gift. How much gold is Solomon bringing in every single year? Look at the next verse. Verse 14. 666 talents of gold. He's taking in over three times as much. Am I doing that math right? Four. I mean, he's taking more than five times as much as any one gift is in an annual level. Yes, Jen? Because of a coincidence, that's why. Uh, yeah, that, that's why. I was I'm prepared for that question. Uh, yeah, Solomon's amount of gold has the number of the beast on it before anybody knew what the number of the beast was. Checkmate. We found it. The beast is Solomon. <laughs> not really. Not, not really. I jest. I hope you all will keep that in context. Uh, we've discussed what that is before. Yes, Jen? Spices. What about? Well, yeah, I mean, the Queen of Sheba brought more spices than anyone else. Yeah, she brought a record amount of spices in. Um, and okay, you know that what? Well, Sheba, Sheba, we we mentioned Sheba is probably more located in the Arabian and Peninsula, the south direction. Jesus calls her the Queen of the South, so I mean, you know, maybe she comes from that direction, but. The thought is most likely present-day Yemen on the Arabian Peninsula, which I realize I said that. I'm wondering, you know, yeah, not, not everybody can find Yemen on a map, I suppose, so I don't know if I'm necessarily singling that out or not. Uh, it's, tr it's tricky with Middle Eastern countries or with any countries in general. Um, but what's the real point of this story? Um, you know, I mean, the Queen of Sheba's gift is clearly extravagant by normal standards, but compared to Solomon's wealth, it's, Solomon eclipses her in every way. He eclipses everybody. The Lord has made him wealthier than everybody, wiser than everybody, you know, more powerful than everybody. So what does Jesus think of this situation? What did Jesus think of Solomon, and what did Jesus think of the Queen of Sheba? Yes, he did. Yeah, there's two passages, and they basically say the same thing in Matthew 12, 42, and Luke 11, 31. I'll go ahead and read the Matthew passage, since it's, uh, we haven't covered Matthew as recently. In Matthew 12, uh, and Jesus is talking about signs, and how the people demand a sign from him, and Jesus points out the folly of that. 
And verses 41 and 42 of Matthew 12, he says that the men of Nineveh will stand up with this generation at the judgment and will condemn it because they repented at the preaching of Jonah and behold, something greater than Jonah is here. The queen of the south will rise up with this generation at the judgment and will condemn it because she came from the ends of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon and behold, something greater than Solomon is here. Now the Queen of Sheba talks about how the, the half was not even told to me. Well, Jesus says, you know what? There's another half that wasn't even told to that story. Because there's something greater than Solomon. As majestic and as wonderful and as wise as Solomon was, who is wiser than Solomon is? Jesus. Right. Yeah. And that's the thing, you know, technically, you know, King says that Solomon was the wisest person who ever lived. There was none like him before him or after him. This is where we get into trouble. Some people interpret the hyperbole too literally, and they say, well, Solomon must have been wiser than Jesus. No. No one is wiser than Jesus. He's the Word of God incarnate from the foundation of the world. And Jesus himself says that someone greater than Solomon is here. In reference to himself. The Queen of Sheba... We don't even know her name, but we know this about her. She got the point. She understood it. She got the significance of the fact that Solomon had wisdom, and she blessed the God of heaven for it, because she recognized where it came from. How much more should those who witness the wisdom of Jesus, the Word of God, who existed from the beginning, recognize Him? And bless God for that. I read a comment that I thought was rather pointed. Now, because sometimes people read the Queen of Sheba story and they, you know, they kind of patronize her or you know, they overlook her or whatnot. But uh, the statement from Dale Ralph Davis is rather pointed. He says, don't, dare, don't you dare read 1 Kings 10 and pat the Queen of Sheba on the head. You can do that. You can view this regal story in 1 Kings in the same way you do an old classic movie. It has entertainment value but no serious relevance. But don't you dare patronize this royal lady or look on her as a fascinating literary cipher because unless you bow before the Son of God, you will be she will be striding into the judgment hall and pointing her finger at you. There's a lot of truth to that. On judgment day, the Queen of Sheba will be there judging people. You know, she will rise up with this generation in the judgment and condemn it, Jesus says. Because if she could figure it out, if she could get it, having as little information at her disposal as she had, what about us? Yeah, she did. You know, and if she can do that with as little information as she had at her disposal. I mean, it's not like it's not like people were going around distributing Bibles. The Bible hadn't even been written yet. You know, bare bones material at best. Jesus hadn't come yet. But if she could figure out who the Lord was based just on that, we are even less, we are with even less excuse today having the Word of God fully revealed to us, having Jesus as the finality of revelation given to us. To whom much is given, much will be required. Any comments or questions on the Queen of Sheba? Now the remainder of chapter... Oh, yes, you have something. I guess it was just the whole topic of the story, I guess, was just different foreigners that came to town and got knowledge or something. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I mean, there's, there's situations like that, certainly. I mean, Jesus uses Naaman and uh, the widow of Zarephath as an example in Luke chapter 4, for instance, where he points out that you know, there were a lot of lepers in Israel, but only Naaman the Syrian got healed. Uh, the widow, there were a lot of widows in Israel, but only the widow of Zarephath got the benefit of Elijah's presence. And, you know, the implicit point here is that God cares about the Gentiles too. The Queen of Sheba is an example of that. The men of Nineveh were an example of that. I mean, the Ninevites lived in a culture that, you know, was all about self-glorification. You know, all about, you know, look how awesome the Assyrians are. And they repented at the preaching of Jonah. If they could do it, I mean, if the men of Nineveh can find repentance, anybody, at the, if the men of Nineveh can find repentance, as arrogant as they were, and as poor of a preacher as Jonah was, how much more anybody else? Something to think about. 
verse 14. Now, the first part of chapter 10, the Queen of Sheba is given a, a tour of Solomon's wealth, and she's left speechless by it. The remainder of chapter 10, we're given a tour of Solomon's wealth, and it's supposed to leave us speechless. Let's read this together. The weight of gold which came into Solomon in one year was 666 talents of gold. Besides that, from the traders and the wares of the merchants and all the kings of the Arabs and the governors of the country, King Solomon made 200 large shields of beaten gold using 600 shekels of gold on each large shield. He made 300 shields of beaten gold using three minas of gold on each shield. And the king put them in the house of the forest of Lebanon. Moreover, the king made a great throne of ivory and overlaid it with refined gold. There were six steps to the throne and a round top to the throne at its rear and arms on each side of the seat and two lions standing before the, beside the arms. Twelve lions were standing there on the six steps on the one side and on the other. Nothing like it was made for any other kingdom. All King Solomon's drinking vessels were of gold. All the vessels of the house of the forest of Lebanon were of pure gold. None was of silver. It was not considered valuable in the days of Solomon. The king had at sea the ships of Tarshish with the ships of Hiram. Once every three years the ships of Tarshish came bringing gold and silver, ivory and apes and peacocks. So King Solomon became greater than all the kings of the earth in riches and in wisdom. All the earth was seeking the presence of Solomon to hear his wisdom which God had put in his heart. They brought every man his gift, articles of silver and gold, garments, weapons, spices, horses and mules, so much year by year. Solomon gathered chariots and horsemen. He had 1,400 chariots and 12,000 horsemen. And he stationed them in the chariot cities and with the king in Jerusalem. The king made silver as common as the stones in Jerusalem. And he made cedars as plentiful as sycamore trees that are in the lowland. Also Solomon's import of horses from Egypt and Kew. And the king's merchants procured them for Kew, from Kew for a price. A chariot was imported from Egypt for 600 shekels of silver and a horse for 150. And by the same means, they exported them to all the kings of the Hittites and to the kings of the Arameans. Okay. So, we talk about the wealth from the Queen of Sheba. Now we'll talk about the wealth from everybody else. And if, there's a, if you think there's a lot of references to gold in this text, you're right. Solomon's annual gold import was 666 talents of gold, which, and this one I actually did do the math on, so, all right, if we assume that a talent weighed about 75 pounds, which is a rough guesstimate, then this comes out to about just under 25 tons a year. Now, gold, if gold is, uh, assuming today, the current gold price is like $1,111 an ounce in today's money, that means it's $17,776 today to get a pound of gold. One ton would be over $35 million. In today's dollars, Solomon's annual import is worth over $888 million. Quite an economy he's bringing in. Now, of course, you know, when you talk about we live in a world of innumeracy where the government spends billions and gets into debt for trillions and things like that. But, uh, you know, so we, we do have to think a little bit in terms of the ancient scale still, even with all those numbers. Solomon's wealth was so prosperous. And if you can't put it in real dollars today precisely, you know what you can do? You can look at what other stuff in his economy is worth. Silver. Silver's not worth anything. How many economies are there where silver's not worth anything? It's rare. Well, I mean, silver's use, I mean, you know, silver is what people, was the currency, you know, in the time of Jesus. Jesus was sold for silver. It was considered enough price to betray the Lord. 30 pieces of silver. Solomon made silver worthless. He took, I mean, imagine that. An economy in which no silver dishes are made for the temple of Solomon because silver isn't good enough to make dishes out of. It's as common as the stones on the ground. Solomon makes shields for his house. You know, we, told, we brought it up in chapter 7. You know, somebody pointed out, I think it was Mark, that Solomon's house did not have gold in it the way the temple did. Well, didn't plate the walls with gold, but he decorated the house with a lot of gold shields, didn't he? You know, and what we got is 200 large shields and 300 regular sized shields in verses 16 and 17. And again, I mean, you know, you work out the prices on these things. You know, a large shield at 600 shekels would have been about 15 pounds of gold, which, I mean, is more than most people pay for a house. And then. 
uh, at three minas, the small shields would have weighed three to four pounds, you know, about $66,000 in today's money. Solomon's throne, made out of ivory, which itself is an expensive import, overlaid with gold, because, who, because I mean, who wants to sit on a regular old ivory chair? Let's cover it with gold and make it a gold chair. Twelve lions guard the stairs, nothing like it in any other kingdom. Uh, exotic imports, gold, silver, baboons, peacocks, uh, in comparison to Solomon, no king aped Solomon in the number of imports and exotic animals that he brought in. Now, they're bringing these in from Tarshish. That's like modern day Spain or something. Now, later on in 1 Kings chapter 22, Jehoshaphat and Ahaziah try to restore the sea trade and they fail. They want to go back to Solomonic prosperity, but they can't because the Lord undermines their efforts in that instance. The narrator gives you his assessment of all of this here, verses 23 through 25. It says that Solomon was greater than all the kings of the earth. Now, he brought in all these apes, but few kings aped Solomon. God has fulfilled his promise. Everybody wants to be in Solomon's presence to hear his wisdom. And everyone who comes to Solomon comes bringing gifts. And then there's a reference to horses. What do we think about the fact that Solomon has so many horses? Ah, yeah, yeah. And here's, I think, the ominous ringing here. Is Solomon is very prosperous. And prosperity is clearly a gift from the Lord. But there's a warning in Deuteronomy 17 that we need to remember. It's not a warning that just you can hand wave away while reading this text. That the king is not to multiply gold for himself. And he's not to multiply horses for himself. And what's the third thing he's not supposed to multiply? Anybody remember? Wives. Now, the end of chapter 10. He multiplies gold. Quite a lot of gold. Okay. Multiplies horses. Okay. Well, setting this up for what happens in chapter 11. When he multiplies wives for himself. And the wives proved to be his undoing. Solomon had a lot of silver. His economy made it as common as the stones on the ground. And what I think is interesting about all of this is even though silver is worthless, what's he paying for these horses? Verse 29. How much, how much is he paying for these horses and chariots? He's paying silver. Silver's worthless. You know, it's not taking a dent in him at all to buy these horses. And he's turning around and selling them. We don't know for how much, but we assume he's selling them for profit. He's exporting them to the Hittites and the Arameans. So, I mean, Solomon's got a huge horse trade going on. But it's, it's ominous because it, you know, it's preparing us for what happens in chapter 11. Yes, Jen. I, there was well, you know, there, there were there was actually more than one group of Hittites that existed. There were Hittites that lived in the in the land of Canaan that had kind of migrated there. But the predominant field of the Hittite kingdom was actually up more in Anatolia and what we would consider modern day Turkey. So it's possible that he's exporting to foreign or to Hittites outside of the kingdom of Israel, which in a northward direction, Aram is that way, and the Hittite kingdom is similarly in that direction. Um, but that's a, good, that's a good question to ask, though. Um, you know, but let's end this on a more positive note, since, I mean, we're preparing to go into some darker stuff in Solomon's reign next week. Is there anything better than what Solomon's kingdom has to offer that we've seen here? And what is it? Heaven. heaven. Why? What's the economy in heaven like? Well, this, this rebounds from heaven. Why? You know, this was heaven on earth. Mm -hmm. We were going to have a greater Right, and what, 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 what is the image describing heaven? The streets are paved with gold. Exactly. Instead of having silver as common as the stones on the ground, we make the pavement out of gold. Yeah. So what Solomon's got is great, yeah. But as Jesus said, something greater than Solomon is here. So, strive for the kingdom that's greater than Solomon. And that, that, that's, I guess, the closing exhortation of this class tonight. Thank you all for your comments and your attention, and we'll pick up with chapter 11 next time.